Welcome everyone. Today's webinar, Infection Control and Industrial Safety for Medical Interpreters, is presented by our guest, Linda Golley, who manages the Innovative Interpreter Services Program at the University of Washington Medical Center in Seattle. She teaches interpreters and healthcare professionals on topics such as cultural competence at end of life, medical terminology, barriers to care, and non-print-based patient education methods. Linda has a bachelor's in international political economics and her master's is in organizational management. She builds context for the National Council on Interpreting and Healthcare Home for Trainers webinar work group. She's an active trainer for Notice and Tahit. And we're very pleased to have Linda with us today. Before I give her the floor, I want to go over a couple of household uh, issues. You are all on mute right now, and if you're joining us over the phone, at the end of the webinar, please send me an email just saying, yes, I attended today's webinar over the phone. My email address is managing.director at cchicertification.org, or you can just hit reply to the webinar reminder that you received. Um, at the end, uh, during the webinar, we will have several polls, which you will see on the screen, and if you are joined, uh, joining us uh, via computer, you can click uh, the answers. Uh, also, uh, your participation determines if you're getting the certificate of attendance at the end. You need to participate in all the polls, so be uh, attentive throughout the whole webinar. Uh, you will receive the certificate of attendance by Monday, uh, and uh, by that I mean by the end of working day on Monday on Western Coast. Um, it will be an email with the text of the certificate in the body of the email, not an attachment. However, if you don't get it, please send me an email and I'll resend it to you as a PDF attachment. And um, please uh, uh, type your questions at the, uh, during the webinar. We will have the time to answer them at the end where I will read them out for uh, Linda to answer. And with that, I'll give the floor to Linda. Hello, everybody. I'm so delighted to be with you today. I get to talk to you about a subject which is near and dear to my heart. I've been in healthcare for 35 years in different capacities. And I've been really excited as I've prepared this material for medical interpreters to see how much there is to learn. And I am truly impressed with how dangerous our healthcare environment is to work in. So I hope that by the end of our time together today that you have a new awareness of your industrial environment and that you will feel very competent and confident and safe um, to work in that environment. You are welcome to use this material freely to share with your colleagues. Um, I encourage you to do so. What we really want is for every medical interpreter out there to be really, really confident about um, the environment that we're working in so that we can be safe and we can keep our patients and our community safe. So our objectives for today's webinar are as follows, and they're pretty big objectives. We want to catapult ourselves from being a language worker into being a very conscious member of the healthcare team. We want to be as safe as the members, the other members of the healthcare team are. We need to avoid bringing germs from the outside where we live and where we take care of our children, bringing germs from those communities to our patients in the healthcare setting. Likewise, we want to avoid bringing germs from the healthcare setting into our communities. We don't want to infect all those sweet little kids in our, in our child's daycare, for example, with something that we brought from the hospital or from the clinic. We don't want to be a vector between patients. You know how we go from the pediatrics department to the, to the chemo infusion unit, um, to the ortho unit, to the newborn intensive care unit. We want to make sure that we cut any um, 
transfer of germs between those patients. And we also want to make sure we don't get sick ourselves. I'm going to talk to you specifically about hand hygiene, how to wash our hands properly, and how to use personal protective equipment. And we are going to talk over and over again about how to avoid getting hurt ourselves, how to avoid being abused, irradiated, or depressed. Next. The two sections of our webinar are quite distinct. The first part of the webinar specifically refers to infection control concepts and techniques. In other words, we're going to be talking about germs, bacteria, viruses, funguses. In the second part of the webinar, we're going to expand our look at the risks that we have in the healthcare environment. We work in a complex industrial environment, and there are many different risks. Each of us practices in a specific state, or sometimes in a couple of states, and we are in jurisdictions which have very specific rules. So we have federal guidelines from the CDC, the Center for Disease Control. We have state departments of health. We have the Joint Commission, and we have accrediting bodies for clinic systems. And every single hospital and clinic system has its own specific protocols, and we need to be aware of those and follow them. Generally, medical interpreters have never looked at any of those sets of reg regulations. I strongly encourage you to become aware of those. Most medical interpreters have never received any training in infection control unless they have been staff interpreters um, for a hospital or clinic system, or if they come from a healthcare background themselves. And we do have doctors and nurses and many other professionals who come from other countries and work as medical interpreters. But we also have many colleagues who work as medical interpreters but have never specifically had infection control training. So once again, we want to make sure that when we walk into the room with the patient, the doctor, the nurse, and the patient can be assured that when we bend over them in the bed or in the chair, that we are safe. They expect us to be safe, so we need to actually be safe. Next. Nice little picture of germs there. Go ahead. Here are some of the concepts that we're going to touch on today. The concept of a vector of infection, reservoir of infection, incubation period, what is required as personal immunization in the healthcare setting, the concept of both universal precautions and extended precautions, procedures that we need to take and observe, which are our most vulnerable populations that we encounter and how to take special care of them, and specific very critical environments such as sterile procedure areas where we have to know exactly how to proceed, and some proactive behaviors a little bit if those are permitted in the facilities where you work. The concept of vector of infection has two parts. A vector, when you think of it in mathematical terms, is always represented by an arrow. It has a beginning point, and then there's an arrow that shows the direction that it goes in. So when we say a vector of infection, that means that the germ, the organism, starts in one place and then is carried to another place. It is transferred to another place. Some germs are carried by the air, some on surfaces, some by blood, and so on. The medical interpreter can be both kinds of vectors. The medical interpreter can be a mechanical vector, and I'll explain that. And he or she can also be a biological vector. We need to make sure that we stop being or that we are not either one of those vectors. 
When we are a mechanical vector, that means that the germs settle on us and we carry them to someplace else, to, a, to another patient, to another person, but we ourselves are not infected. So if you're on the bus and the person next to you coughs and sneezes all over your coat, and you come into the hospital and you put your coat on the back of a chair and then the little kid comes up and puts his hand on your coat, you have been a mechanical vector there. The germ has not infected you, but you have effectively brought that germ from one patient into another setting where it can infect someone. We can also be a biological vector. That person on the bus might cough and you might actually get that germ into your, um, your buccal mucosa, your nasal mucosa, and you might become infected by that germ, and then you go and you carry that inside your body, and you eventually pass that germ on to other people in your environment. In that way, you are a biological vector. Um, we want to make sure that we understand the difference between colonization and infection. Most of us have MRSA on our skin, but we are not infected with it. We're colonized with it, we're carried around with us, but it is not making us sick. It is not a pathological condition at that point. However, if we go into the neonatal intensive care unit and this little tiny baby who is premature and does not have a good immune system yet gets this MRSA onto its body, it can actually die from getting the MRSA into its, into its environment. So in that case, the baby would be infected where we are only colonized. Next. We can serve as a reservoir of infection. Um, the whole concept of vaccination and whether to get vaccinations really rests on this basic concept, which is that if we vaccinate the general population and specifically the healthcare workers, which includes interpreters, then all of us cannot serve as a reservoir of infection that can then serve as a stepping stone for these very dangerous organisms to a vulnerable person. So it is absolutely critical for every healthcare worker, including medical interpreters, to get all of the vaccinations that can prevent the diseases, um, which we call vaccine-preventable diseases. And I will enumerate those on a, on a future slide. One thing we need to watch out for is the incubation period for diseases. Um, Interpreters, just like everyone else, need to get a good paycheck, so often we go to work when we're starting to feel a little bit not so healthy, but if you realize that you're probably looking at the end of the incubation period and that tomorrow you're going to be really sick, you want to make sure that you don't go to work even when you're just beginning to feel icky because you often are already very infectious. With Ebola, we know that you are not actually infectious until you have full symptoms, but with the flu, that is not the case. With the flu, influenza, you are infectious during your incubation period. So you need to be very highly alert to illnesses, sicknesses, and not go to work on those days if it means direct contact with patients. The vaccine effectiveness time lapse is also very important, and most organizations are beginning to require that medical interpreters and all healthcare workers are vaccinated at the very beginning of the flu season now each year. Flu vaccine becomes available toward the beginning of October, and it's really important to get vaccinated at the beginning of the season because even after we get vaccinated, there is a two-week period before the body can take that vaccine and create a protective mechanism. So during those two weeks, we are still susceptible to getting the flu ourselves, then having that incubation period, and making people around us, including our patients, very ill. I strongly recommend that you get vaccinated at the beginning of the, of the flu period each year. 
these are the vaccine preventable diseases, measles, mumps, rubella, chickenpox, tetanus, diphtheria, pertussis, and flu. In some years, we will have additional diseases. Um, it might be bird flu. It might be um, whatever is going around the year in that around the world in that particular year. Um, we also, for our own safety, should be immunized against hepatitis B, which is a bloodborne disease. TB management is very different. Um, many medical interpreters come from countries where they received a vaccine against TB, which is called the BCG. We know from research recently that BCG is not um, completely protective. Many people, some say up to 50% of people who've had the BCG are actually not protected against TB anymore from their vaccination. So what we do here in the United States is a completely different way of managing TB exposure in healthcare workers, and that is we place the skin test to see if we have been exposed lately. Uh, to tuberculosis. So if you uh, grew up in the United States, you will have the TB test placed on your skin, and if it shows um, red and raised, that means that you have been exposed and your body is busy creating antibodies to the tuberculosis bacillus. For people who've had the BCG, they can't have the TB test placed often because it's always going to show red, so we need to do symptom checks with you periodically to make sure that you're not starting to show any symptoms. Next. Well, and this is the time for our first poll. I have seen several of you having questions of what do you need to do. So uh, this is the time when um, on the screen you are going to see the question. And there will be two buttons, true and false. Before you answer those questions, Linda is going to explain the question to you so that you know what means true and what means false. So here is our first question. Okay, so is it, 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 the question says, it is important to find out what infections patients may have ahead of time so that the interpreter can refuse assignments if he doesn't like the disease that they have. Go ahead and tell me if you think that that is true or false, if that is how uh, medical interpreters should behave about finding out what diseases their upcoming patients may have. Okay, so we have about uh 30 seconds before I close, and I see that 77% already participated, so please make your choice. And again, if you are on the phone, you cannot do this choice at the end of the webinar. Just send me an email, and uh, you can answer at that time if you wish, but I just want to make sure that you uh, are aware which kind of questions we are discussing here. All right, I'm closing the, po post, uh, the poll, and I would like to share the results with you. They'll appear on okay. the screen in a second. 79% thinks that uh, this was uh, a false uh, statement, and 21% thinks that this uh, was a uh, correct statement. Okay, this is a, a really great poll to put in there because um, it kind of helps us differentiate between ourselves as language workers and ourselves as healthcare workers. So this can move us really quickly into the discussion of why are we in that room? What are we, what is our purpose there? Are we there to just get our paycheck? Are we there to make sure that the doctor and the patient understand each other but we're basically just doing a technical function? Or are we part of the healthcare team dedicated to the well-being of the patient population in the community that we work in. I would like to submit to you that we want to move towards having the consciousness of being part of the healthcare team and 
really focusing on the well-being of our patient population as a whole, as all other healthcare members of the team are. And we will touch on this again a little bit later, but I submit to you that if, if your sister or brother was, was working as a nurse or a doctor, that they would not be choosing their patients based on whether those patients had certain illnesses or not. So I would like to submit to you that as medical interpreters, we want to definitely move to have the same viewpoint about our patients. Yes, we do want to know what diseases our patients have, but not so that we can choose to refuse to interpret for them. To the contrary, so that we can move fully and confidently into taking care of them properly and safely. Let's talk here about some restrictions on which assignments to accept or not. In terms of the safety of the interpreter himself or herself, there are some assignments that you might not want to take for your own safety. Um, that is the same as any healthcare worker would consider. So if you are pregnant, you should or could refuse assignments dealing with ill children or with ill adults with active infections. Um, that's up to you, and many interpreters who are pregnant work perfectly safely through their pregnancy but we want to make sure that you're protected, so use all the per personal protective equipments and, and techniques. If you have low immune status, you should discuss with your healthcare provider which types of patients it's safe for you to work with for your own sake. We have interpreters on my staff who are taking very strong um, medications to reduce inflammation, and they are at risk of becoming infected by certain kinds of diseases, and so we actually do not assign them to highly infectious patients. Also, if you're pregnant, you would not want to accept radiology um, assignments. For the safety of your patients, interpreters should not work directly with patients at all if they are exhibiting infectious um, symptoms and these are the key symptoms to look out for. Fever, chills, runny nose, cough, rash, open sores on the skin, or diarrhea. Okay, next. We have three different terms for health-associated infections, which mean that the patient came to us for care for something, and while he was getting cared for, he got sick with something different because we gave him that sickness. If he had not come to us for care, he would not have had that sickness. So we call them health-associated infections. We also call them nosocomial infections. It comes from the old Greek word nosocomio, which means hospital. We also call these infections iatrogenic infections. Iatro means treatment, and genic means where it comes from, the origin of it. So all of these different terms clearly point to us as the healthcare workers as the cause of the infection. The Center for Disease Control um, puts out statements every year explaining how deadly we can be to our patients. Their most recent post is, I quote, every year an estimated 2 million patients in the United States get a hospital-related infection. In other words, they would not have had that infection without us giving it to them. And 90% of those 2 million, excuse me, 90,000 people of those 2 million die from their infection. That's a pretty heavy guilt burden. When you think about all of the different openings that patients have into their bodies, they, they might have an indwelling uh, urinary catheter. They might have a port that they're getting their medications through. Uh, they may have a fistula for their um, diabetic treatment. They may have a surgical site. 
they may have a ventilator. There are so many different routes into the human body um, that they really, we didn't used to have those many routes into the human body in the hospital, but we have so many now. And infection can be brought into the patient by all of those different routes by us, the healthcare workers. Next. Now, different hospitals and clinic systems, um, which all recognize how serious this problem is of how we're giving our patients infections, they all create slightly different sets of rules. So as a medical interpreter, many of us go to different hospitals and clinics every day. It's very important to start learning the specific protocols in each hospital and clinic system. And those protocols change from year to year. In my own hospital, I have seen tremendous changes in the 12 years that I have been working as the interpreter services manager here. Um, all of the infection control protocols that I'm showing you in this webinar are fairly new and are quite changed from 12 years ago. Next. In some settings, the medical interpreter is very, very much encouraged to be part of the effort to help keep the environment free from transmission of germs. In my hospital, we expect everyone on the healthcare team to be very proactive. If we see someone sitting in a waiting room coughing and sneezing, and sniffling and leaving a bunch of icky Kleenex all over the, the tables between the chairs. We specifically want the interpreter, the front desk person, anyone on the healthcare team to approach the patient, offer him a mask, offer him Kleenexes, bring a trash can over, offer him a way to cleanse his hands, and just explain that we would like to keep everyone safe. Not every hospital or clinic system welcomes that, so be alert to how proactive you can be, and then be as proactive as you can in that environment. Next. Our most vulnerable patient populations are our little tiny babies in the neonatal, neonatal intensive care units, our ICU patients, our cancer patients, transplant patients, HIV and AIDS patients, and other patients who are taking immune suppression um, mechanisms, for example, strong doses of steroids. Also, some patients have never been able to receive vaccines because of other medical conditions. Now, interpreters can see that some of these patient populations are vulnerable, like when you walk onto the NICU, you know you're on the NICU. But you will have no reason to know that you're talking to an HIV patient unless you're paying careful attention during the session and you happen to hear that this patient has HIV or AIDS. Be hyper alert to these vulnerable populations and take extra, extra precautions. When we go onto units that are full of vulnerable populations like NICU and ICU cancer and transplant units. Be specifically careful. Take nothing into the patient room because everything you take in there can bring germs in on its surface. Take off your outer street clothing. Leave it outside the room. Be sure you gel in. Don't touch anything in the room. Don't shake hands. Don't touch the baby and be sure to refuse the assignment if you are ill. Sometimes if you start feeling icky in the morning and you show up on the NICU and you know that they're not going to have an interpreter otherwise, they might let you interpret by phone from outside the room. We do a lot of proactive um, problem solving that way with interpreters who are thinking, oh, maybe I really shouldn't be here in the NICU inside with the baby today. I'm feeling a little bit fluey. Here we're coming back to that topic of before. Um, when I was putting together this material, I talked with my colleagues at Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, with the HIV AIDS um, group in Seattle, and with many other colleagues. And people asked me to be sure to mention that they had concern 
Having seen that many interpreters have refused to interpret for patients who have HIV, for patients who have tuberculosis, um, I heard this comment and this concern from so many of my colleagues that I wanted to make sure and include it in this webinar for you. As you go out and talk to your colleagues, please be a messenger on behalf of the patients in these populations. They need your help and our help as language bridges probably even more than other patients because they're so much vulnerable they're so much more vulnerable. Next. So now we're going to talk about hand hygiene. Hand hygiene means taking, taking care that your hands are absolutely clean. When I started in healthcare 35 years ago, what we did was we washed our hands, or we were supposed to wash our hands, for almost three minutes before and after each patient. It is completely impractical to do that, and the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, did a massive study and showed that massive hand washing actually damages the skin on your hands, and it makes your skin on your hands more susceptible to carrying germs than if you weren't washing your hands at all. So we have a completely different approach to hand sanitization now than we did before, and it involves alcohol gel, which is very effective against most kinds of germs. What you need to do is learn to get over any revulsion you have for that slippery feeling that the gel gives you when you use it. We need to gel in and gel out with every single patient. That means outpatients, inpatients. If you're sitting at the admitting desk, gel in and gel out because you're handing papers back and forth, you're sitting knee to knee. Just get used to gelling in and gelling out each time. I'm going to ask you to close your hand, close your eyes, so that I can describe to you the correct way of using alcohol gel to get your hands really clean instead of just thinking that they're clean. So close your eyes, hold out your left hand in front of you with the palm up. Pretend that you're squirting from the bottle of gel two squirts into the palm of your left hand. Now you've got a puddle of gel in your left hand. Take your right hand and put all of your fingertips together and your thumb tip all together and dip it in the puddle. Kind of move it around so that all of your fingertips are completely wet. Now open your right hand, palm up and transfer the puddle, kind of wipe your left hand onto your right palm so that the whole puddle goes onto your right palm. Take your left fingertips and thumb tip, roll them around in the puddle, and now rub the gel on other parts of your hands. Hold each thumb with each other hand, completely go around your thumb. Now turn your hand over and rub on the back side of your hand up into the areas between the fingers. Do that on both hands. And now finish just by covering all the remaining surfaces. And in the time that I've been explaining that, you will have completed a proper 30-second gel cleansing of your hands. Most of the germs on your hands are in the, on the fingertips around your nails. About 90% of the germs are around your nails. Long nails and fake nails cannot be worn in the healthcare setting any longer. This is a new thing, but it's very strict. It's wonderful for people to look nice when they come as a medical interpreter. Um, people love seeing pretty ladies and men with nice, nice looking nails, but you need to have very short nails, no fake nails, and you need to get those nails really, really, really well alcoholed. Next. Next, here's a picture. Um, for those of you on the phone, I'm showing a picture of an inpatient room covered with little green X's. And the little green X's represent areas that 
when we took a swab and took it to the laboratory to see if there were any um, organisms still there, any germs still sitting on those surfaces after we had cleaned this room, we find that pretty much the entire inside of this inpatient room is still covered with green X's all over the little rolly table where people put their food, the little cabinets where they put their personal items, the IV cart, the sink, the bed, everything in the room still has green X's after we thought we had cleaned this room. So if you're the interpreter and you walk in here and you put your purse or your iPhone down on one of these surfaces, you've just picked up whatever is sitting on that surface. And then when you leave the room, you're taking it with you. And then you put it down in the next room, you're, you get my point. Next. Next. I'm showing a picture of two hands, and there are red parts and other colored parts. The red parts show the areas of your hands that are most frequently missed when people do hand washing. So you can see that the fingertips are red, and the thumb, the whole back side of the thumb and part of the front side of the thumb is missed, and in between the fingers is missed on both the front and the back of the hands. So now that you've seen this picture, you know to make sure that when you gel in and gel out, be conscious and get those parts of your hands because this is how we kill patients, is not getting these areas um, decontaminated. Now, um, I'll touch on this again in a little bit, but I want to point out that there are a few germs that will not go away with alcohol gel. And we will know about those by the placards that are outside of the rooms. You will be specifically directed to wash your hands with soap and water in those cases, but it's not because soap and water kills those organisms. It doesn't kill them. So why should we do it? We do it because the mechanical rubbing of the hands underwater physically pushes these germs off the surface of your skin and down the sink. So when you are alerted to do a hand wash with soap and water because it's a really nasty germ. Be sure that you're actually pushing everything off the surfaces of your hands down into the sink because that's what, you're, that's what you need to do with those particular kinds of germs. Next. We're going to talk about precautions. We, we now talk about two different kinds of precautions. But I'm going to take you back to even before we had precautions, because the universe looked really different then. And my guess is that for some medical interpreters, the universe is still, is, still looks like that. It's kind of a pre-precautions view. So when I first went into healthcare, we didn't, we didn't know about HIV yet. When we were taking care of our patients, we would assume that a patient was completely safe for us to work around unless he had a specific disease that was in his chart that we knew about. So I had a handful of patients that I knew had tuberculosis, and I had a, hand patient, a handful of patients that I knew had certain kinds of skin infections, and I had a couple of patients that I knew had hepatitis B. But I assumed, as did all my coworkers, that all of our other patients were completely safe to work around. We could draw blood. We, could, we didn't have to take any precautions. So we didn't wear gloves. We didn't wear gowns with those other patients. Once um, in the early 1980s, we started becoming aware of the HIV epidemic. We completely changed the way we look at infectiousness and risk. And we put into place something called universal precautions, which means that we now assume that every patient has a disease, an organism that can kill us if we're exposed to it. Complete 180 degrees reversal of that. So we now consider every bodily fluid, 
certainly blood, but also other bodily fluids, to be highly infectious in every case. It doesn't matter if you're drawing blood from a newborn, an 80-year-old person, a person who's never had sex, it doesn't matter. You treat them as though they have a disease that can kill you. That's universal precautions. And we have tools to keep you safe from that. But there are other kinds of infectious diseases that we have to add on to that universal precaution because we actually know for a fact that that patient is suspected of or known to have a particular infection on their body or in, inside their body that we need to take additional precautions for. So when you see a patient, any patient at all, you are going to take universal precautions. You are also going to be alert for extended precautions, which means additional things that you need to pay attention to. So as we walk through this, the specific types of precautions and we look at the protective equipment that you will be using, keep in mind that there are two sets of precautions that we are always going to be alert to. Think about all the places that you are present where you could get exposed to bodily um, substances or patients' breath or contaminated surfaces. I'll run through some of those for you. Surgical episodes, traumatic wounds, births. Gosh, there's blood all over the place. Respiratory procedures are one of the most dangerous types of procedures. Dental procedures, IV placement, catheter placement, oscopy procedures, anyone who's vomiting or has diarrhea, um, puncturing of abscesses, stuff goes all over the room, can go in people's eyes, lumbar punctures, intramuscular injections, vaccinations, anytime we breach the, the skin, um, we have a potential exposure. So in general, you want to stand back from patients who are having any of those procedures. We don't want to be standing right next to them. Yes, we need to speak clearly and as loudly as necessary rather than standing right next to that patient. Even if it's a hard of hearing patient, be very aware that you need to stand back from those procedures happening. And we need to use all of the barriers. When you look around the room and you see your, your colleagues on the healthcare team wearing barrier clothing protections, you need to immediately get those barrier protections on as well. You want to make sure that you do not ever, ever, ever have food or drink in a patient care area. Don't take your latte into the waiting room. Don't take your latte into the back office, um, period. Just don't do it. Drink and eat somewhere away from patient care areas. And that is mandated by Department of Health, by the way, in every state. Next. I want to emphasize again that besides doing the gowns and all of the techniques that the hospital tells you to do, you as the interpreter want to keep non-essential items out of the patient rooms. So get used to carrying a very slim set of um, items with you. Get a little man bag. If you're a man, clip it onto your, onto your belt so that you can put a gown on over it and it's underneath. Put your car, don't have a huge set of car keys that you've got to put down on a surface. Have a little set of car keys. If you're going to be taking notes, have a fairly small and slim note taking pad, et cetera, et cetera. You need to be able to put everything under a gown so that you're not putting anything down on a surface inside a patient room. Next. You might also think um, just about when you come into the hospital or clinic setting from being outside, you can wash your hands. You can maybe turn your coat inside out and carry it around with you like that to avoid taking droplets into the hospital setting. And when you go home, you might want to not wear your shoes right into the living room. You might want to either 
wipe them off with bleach outside before you go in or just leave them outside your front door and put slippers on. Do you really want to walk from the hospital, wherever you were in the hospital, back into your own living room? And I suggest that you wear clothing and coats that can be washed easily and frequently to cut down on droplet transmission in and out of facilities. Next. Okay, we are ready for our second poll, and you will see it on the screen in a minute, and Linda will explain the question to you before you answer it. So the okay, so the question is, medical interpreters are not dangerous to patients if they are careful not to shake hands with the patient. In other words, is it true that if you're just careful not to shake hands with patients, you don't have to worry about any germ transmission because that's all it takes. That's all you have to worry about is just don't shake hands and you don't have to think about anything else to prevent um, transmission of germs. Is that true or false? Okay, we have about 83% of you who voted already, so I'll give you a couple more seconds to finish off. Okay, so I'm closing the poll, and I can uh, share with you that 98% uh, of you believe that the statement was false. Okay, well, this is great. Um, it is false. We definitely don't want to be shaking hands with our patients or our family members anymore. Um, I'm a strong handshaker myself. My father taught me to always shake hands and make eye contact, and, and I love shaking hands with people. And as time goes on and we learn more about infection transmission in the healthcare setting, I am now holding back from shaking hands, um, even with other healthcare um, teammates. So we used to walk in as the interpreter and shake hands with the doctor, and I would recommend that you not do that anymore. But not, not shaking hands is not sufficient. Certainly it's part of what we do, but all of the other precautions and techniques that I'm teaching you are also extremely important. So yes, don't shake hands. However, that's certainly not enough to keep you safe or to keep your patients safe. So now we're going to look at posted precaution notices. I'm going to show you a variety of these notices. And these are generally used on the inpatient side. However, they are also used a lot in emergency rooms and will be used more and more as time goes on because where did that patient in Texas who came back from visiting Liberia get treated and then get sent home? and then infected a bunch of other people. He went to the emergency room at his local hospital. So because we all know now that the hospital should have figured out that he had Ebola, and they didn't figure out that he had Ebola in time, and they sent him home, emergency rooms all over the country have just gone through an enormous effort to train their ER staff to look for possibly really serious infectious diseases, and they've gotten all of these placards out of their bottom drawers, and they're ready to use them. So you as interpreters are going to start seeing these notices everywhere, but you have to look for them. You must start to be aware of them. I went to a patient yesterday who was on a medical unit, and I almost went in, and then I remembered. I looked up, and I noticed that it was not the universal precautions notice on his door. It was a special precautions notice on his door. So I needed to do both universal precautions and extended precautions for that patient. And I followed the instructions on the placard. This is the really nice thing about these placards, is they tell you exactly what to do, and anything that they don't tell you to do, you don't have to do at all. So standard precautions, the one you're looking at right now, which is for all patients, is you gel in 
and you gel out. That's at the top. It shows a hand with um, an, a gel container dispensing a drop. So you're going to gel in and you're going to gel out. However, underneath it says gown and glove if soiling is likely. That means if you're going to be directly working with the patient and getting icky stuff on your hands or your body, then you need a glove and a gown. But if not, if you're the interpreter and you're going to stand apart from the patient, you don't need to put that, those on today. It also says wear a mask and eye cover if splashing body fluids are likely and for aerosolizing procedures, which is like respiratory um, hygiene, if they're going to be um, suctioning the patient. But you as the interpreter are not going to be close enough to get splashed by body fluids, and you're not going to be standing close when they do the respiratory hygiene. So you do not have to wear a mask. So this is universal precautions. Gel in, gel out, nothing else. Next. Now we're going to start looking at some extended precautions and you will see at some point airborne respirator precautions. So a respirator means that the air is going to be screened for you. It's going to go through a filter. It's going to have dangerous stuff taken out of it for you. Next. OK, so here's a very different looking placard. It still says gel in and gel out. That's right at the top, so they keep reminding you on that. But here, it doesn't talk about gloves, and it doesn't talk about gowns. It talks about a respirator protection for you, and it can be either a special mask that is um, a respirator mask. This is not a regular surgical mask. We'll talk about that later. This is an N95 mask. or it's a papper, which is on the left, and it's the little motorized um, gizmo that, where you put a mask over your head, and you breathe in air that has been filtered through that little machine that you're carrying on your waist. Um, either way, what you're breathing in is through a filter, and so you are not getting the infectious stuff into your own lungs. But it doesn't say anything about gowns or gloves, does it? You'll also notice at the bottom that it says airborne infection isolation room required, negative pressure room. That means that the engineers in the hospital are sucking the air out of the patient room up through the ceiling through special filters to take out what they have, like the TB, the tuberculosis that they have, for example, before it goes into general circulation. Now, if you leave the door open, to that room, the patient's germs are going to come out into the hallway. So it's very important that whenever you have an airborne respirator precaution, notice that you keep the door closed. You go in, you close the door. You come out, you close the door. You're just very conscious of that. If you see that your, your patient's family is standing there chatting with the door open, tell them. The door needs to be closed. Go in or come out, but don't stand there with the door open. Next. OK, now we have some precautions that say contact. Any of the precautions, extended precautions, that say contact means that there is stuff, there is infectious material on the surfaces. You certainly don't want to put anything down on any of the surfaces in any of these rooms. And there are different kinds of contact precautions, so you want to go through it, look at what it says for you to do, because it's going to tell you to wear different kinds of things and do or not do certain kinds of things. One of the things you really want to pay attention to is where, where you are going to leave the items that you had on when you leave. Do you leave them out in the hallway so you've brought that stuff out into the hallway? or do you leave it in containers inside the patient's room? It's really important to get that right. So for this one, we have um, a negative pressure room again, so keep the door closed. It says you need to wear a mask with eye protection, and it shows a picture of that. So you'll have a little stand next to the door with those masks provided. 
This is just a surgical mask. It's not one of those respirator masks. It's just a surgical mask. To, to, it's a barrier. It doesn't let droplets in or out, but it doesn't filter anything. And you put on a gown and glove at the door. And it will tell you where to leave that stuff when you come back out. Next. And go ahead to the next one. Droplet precautions are very similar to contact precautions because droplets are in the air and they're on the surfaces. So let's go one more and see if we can see the placard for droplets. There we go. So gel in, gel out. Wear surgical mask. Wear a gown and glove prior to entering the patient room. And over on the left, it says when you take off the personal protective equipment, leave the items in the patient room for disposal. So you'll look around and you'll see where all the other people who've come in and out of the room before you have put their stuff and you will put them in there too. Okay, let's go through the last couple of placards pretty quickly. Okay, more, this is the placard for contacts. Let's keep going. Okay, I want to show, show you this one. This says contact enteric precautions. That means specifically the germs that are around this patient came out of his intestine. It generally comes out and infects the room via the feces. So the patient has these germs all over himself. They're all over the room. They're all over the doorknobs. They're probably all over his visitors, his family members who are in there with him. They're probably all over his rolly cart where he puts his food. So you want to be really, really clear to not put anything down in that room. Um, and often these are the germs where you're going to be told to wash your hands with soap and water. So on this particular placard, it shows soap and water instead of alcohol gel up at the top. Just want to be careful about that. And at the bottom, it shows a stethoscope, and it says, use patient dedicated or disposable equipment, which is your key to think, OK, nothing of mine should be in contact with anything in this room. Absolutely nothing. So leave everything you can outside of this room. <laughs> OK, keep going. Here is a picture of one of our coworkers with her personal protective equipment on. Over her eyes, extending up, way up above her forehead, is a clear mask shield that protects her eyes from any splashes. So if we're in a room where somebody is having a, a boil lanced, um, we're going to have this on as well, because a boil can go spurting. The contents of it are under pressure, and they can spurt out all over the place. And if that got in your eye, that could cause you a really bad infection in your eye. She's also got a mask on, which is probably just a surgical mask, but in some cases she might be wearing a respirator mask that you have to be fitted for. She's wearing a gown, um, just a normal surgical gown. She's not wearing a full coverage gown like she would be in a surgical area. And she's wearing gloves. OK, let's go to the next one. When you take off personal protective equipment, you're going to think about it this way. The front of you is contaminated. The back of you is less contaminated. The inside that touches you is not contaminated. And the outside that faces the patient room is contaminated from the patient. So what you want to do is you want to grab your mask at the back, the little parts, the elastics that are holding it on your head. And you're going to hold on to those and then pull the mask off without touching the front of the mask and drop it in the trash can. You're going to want to take your gloves and hold your finger under the glove and pull it up off your hand without touching the outside of the glove and drop it inside out into the trash can. And your gown, you're going to untie it behind you and then roll it around toward the front with the outside rolled inside so that you're only touching what was touching you before. You're not touching the outside or the front of that gown. And you're going to put it in the container. Next. Now, 
when you have a respirator um, precautions patient, you, and in some hospitals you won't be going into those rooms at all. You'll be doing telephonic for them. But in many hospitals, including our hospital, you will be going into the room. So you will probably, if you're an agency interpreter, you will probably be wearing a PAPR, which is the motorized equipment, because that does not have to be fitted to you. You can just put it over your head. You can have a beard. Um, you can have long hair. It doesn't matter. The mask covers everything and provides pure air for you. You just have to make sure that you ask the nurse to help you put it on properly and then take it off properly when you're done. Because there's a little motorized um, element to it, there's a little bit of noise. So again, you need to speak very clearly and slowly so that communication is optimal. If you are a staff interpreter, you will probably be fitted for an N95 mask, which is a respirator mask. And you have to learn how to wear it properly. Otherwise, you could get really sick. So they teach you how to do that, and they make sure you have the right size. Um, next. So I told you that many of these protocols are changing over time. And certainly, we've seen some big changes in our hospital in the last couple of years that particularly affected the interpreters. So for example, we have a lot of procedures which are done in what we used to think of as procedure areas, but which are now specifically designated as surgical procedure areas. So for example, the um, interventional radiology suites which are in the radiology department, but they're actually surgical procedure areas uh, where we do angiography. We go up into the patient's um, arteries and veins to do repairs. Um, sometimes we do chemoembolization through their veins and arteries. So they're very invasive procedures, and the patient can certainly die if he's exposed to any germs in those environments. So now the interpreters just like the doctors and the staff in those rooms, put on a complete surgical jumpsuit. And they have to put it on in such a way that none of their own skin or their own clothing peeks out under the sleeves or through the neck area. Um, they need to have that complete hairnet on and conform completely to all of the surgical, surgical regulations. So not only will you gel in and gel out, but you will wear gloves over your gelled hands. After you take your gloved, gloves off at the end, you will re-gel. So you need to look out for assignments that you get that are in surgical areas like that, cardiac catheterizations, um, chemoembolizations, so that you're prepared and not surprised by having to really either completely change your clothes or completely cover up your clothes. You will need to take off your jewelry completely. You need to put your purse, I mean your wallet or your keys completely under that or leave it outside um, in a secure area. Next. Here are two of our staff preparing to go into a C-section area. We certainly have a lot of appointed C-sections, but much more commonly we have what we call crash C-sections, where they call us and say, we need somebody up here really fast. Uh, we were doing a normal birth procedure, and we've got a cord around the neck, or we've got something. And so our interpreters have to be able to put these jumpsuits on really, really fast, because people can't wait around for us to, to dither and dally. So dress simply. For women, I would recommend wearing trousers, pants, so that um, you're not struggling with trying to get a long skirt under one of these jumpsuits. Next. This is one of our staff in the interventional radiology suite. She's wearing a full lead cover over her jumpsuit. And she's um, discussing the procedure with the the chief nurse there. You can see that she's got a full face mask on. She's got the hairnet completely covering her. Her neck is completely covered. 
her sleeves do not show any of her clothing underneath. Next. So just as a summary of infection control, think of yourself as a vector, a very dangerous vector. Um, basically, the medical interpreter is the most dangerous vector in the whole healthcare system because we're the only ones who go to all the different parts of the healthcare system, sometimes in one day. Think of yourself as a possible reservoir of infection. Um, be very, very aware of um, how you're feeling and make sure that you're uh, vaccinated. Think about the incubation period for germs, um, what you might be coming down with. Make sure you get your flu vaccine ahead of time. And we're going to ask you some more questions. Yes, it's the time for our next uh, poll. So again, here is the question on the screen in a second, and Linda is going to explain it before you start answering it. Okay. So the question is, medical interpreters are not dangerous to patients as long as they wear a surgical mask when they go to appointments with a cough. So if the interpreter has a cough, is it okay for him or her to go to patient appointments as long as he puts a surgical mask over his own mouth when he goes and does patient care? True or false? True that he's not dangerous or false that he's not dangerous? Okay, I see about 60% uh, of you voted, so I'll give another maybe 20 seconds to finish off. Okay, so the results are that 81% uh, thinks that it is false. Okay, so I am going to take this opportunity to say that if you have a cough, you shouldn't be working as a medical interpreter that day. Just wearing a mask is not going to protect your patients. If you have a cough, you've probably been coughing into the surrounding air around yourself, and you are probably covered with droplets. Um, you are not safe for patient care. So just putting that mask over you is not protecting your patients. If you have the cough, you shouldn't be accepting direct patient care assignments. And especially not of those vulnerable patients, but really not for any patient. I mean, what if it was your grandmother who was in bed, <clears throat> maybe with pneumonia, in the hospital bed, and the interpreter came to take care of your grandmother, and the interpreter starts to tell you, the family member, that the interpreter has had a cough for two days and is feeling a little bit tired. Wouldn't you be upset that that interpreter was there? I would be. I would want my grandmother to be safe. So now we're going to very, very quickly move through the other elements of industrial safety for medical interpreters. I want to really stress that the healthcare environment is a very dangerous environment. Um, I worked on the safety review board for group health when I worked there, and I got to help review all of the on-the-job injuries for all of the healthcare staff every month. And we had mechanical injuries, which I'll talk to you about. We had infections. We had people being assaulted, um, resulting in injuries. So it's really a very complex environment. Every little part of the hospital and clinic system um, has its own dangers. We had, unfortunately, um, in the Seattle area, we had a child who was very badly injured, the child was just accompanying mom to a physical therapy visit, and a piece of equipment fell on this little child and injured the child very, very badly. And that can happen to us as well. So I'm going to move through these different types of risks. What I want to specify is that as a worker, you not only can get hurt, but you have a responsibility to your employer 
whoever is paying you to be there, you have a responsibility to be proactive and not get hurt. So if you were working as a crane operator for a construction company, you would go through all of their safety training and they would tell you, look, these are the ways you can get hurt and you had better not get hurt. It is your responsibility to make sure that you check this, you check that, you don't do this, you double check that, you wear this protective equipment, you let us know if there's anything wrong, you don't use equipment that you know isn't functioning correctly, you, um, all those different kinds of things. Well, this is all true in the healthcare environment as well. And I need to share this with you because you probably are not getting this training from any other place. OK, let's move forward. We've talked about infectious um, infection control concepts. But here again, I want to let you know that it is your responsibility to be proactive, to be looking out for infectious dangers, and to make sure that you take every possible precaution against getting sick yourself or letting anybody else get sick because of your actions. So we need you to be very proactive around those things. Next. <clears throat> the company that, that you're working for if you do get hurt, if you do get exposed to infectious um, risks, hazards, there are very clear response protocols that will come into effect. So if something does happen to you, the company needs to know about it right away. You need to write it down clearly what happened, when it happened. You need to report to the person who's in charge of that unit right away, as well as letting um, whoever is in charge of the language support um, no. So if that's the, the um, interpreter services department or your agency or whoever, both of those groups need to know that you got exposed. And then you need to follow through and do what they tell you um, to follow through with that protocol. Next. Radiation can be very, very dangerous. Um, you need to be proactive. When you are with a patient who is having a radiology procedure, you look at the at the radiation tech, and when that tech goes behind the protective wall, you go behind the wall too. Don't get caught with the patient, ever. Follow that tech back to where he is. Mechanical safety is absolutely critical. Here on our staff, we have had repeated injuries of different interpreters over the years, breaking their toes, breaking their feet, falling down the stairs, slipping in water on the floors um, that the janitor, where the janitors are mopping up problems. Um, an interpreter can really get hurt mechanically. So please slow down. Be aware of things sticking out into the hallways. R little rolling stools in the exam rooms look so inviting. You're tired. You've been standing for three hours somewhere and you see this little rolling stool and you go to sit on it, well, they can shoot out from under you and dump you on the floor. And <laughs> we have had a lot of people injured that way, so just be very careful. I'm showing you a picture now of appropriate clothing for medical interpreters. Now, a couple of the ladies here have bare legs. And I don't recommend that because if a sharp instrument or a needle and syringe goes flying out from where it's being used. Maybe the, per the patient jerks, which happens a lot, and this instrument goes flying across the room. This lady with the, with the bare legs is possibly going to get um, HIV from getting poked by that needle. So I would recommend wearing the, the pants or um, thick stockings or the long skirt or whatever. But you see that none of these people are wearing scarves that could get caught in wheelchair legs. They are not carrying large bags. Um, that's a very professional, slim down look. Be proactive around people in wheelchairs. And be very aware of patients who are propped up in positions where they are not safe. And get help immediately. Yes, we are the interpreters. We are also part of the healthcare team. When you see somebody perched up on the edge of an exam table, 
for a long period of time or somebody whose balance is not good, make a recommendation. Go out in the hallway, get somebody to come in and assess whether that's safe for the patient. You do not want that patient falling on you, falling on someone else, or falling at all. And if you see somebody unsafely in a wheelchair, they're trying to get in and out, it's not locked down, they're not putting their feet up on the footrest, they have an umbrella that can get caught in the wheels, be proactive. You are a critical part of the healthcare team. Step in and just say, I just want to make sure you're safe. Let's make sure that this isn't going to um, get you into trouble. Next. You need to, as a medical interpreter, really be aware of what your own limitations and strengths are. Sometimes um, maybe you're not feeling up to wearing a lead apron for four hours. Maybe you're just not that strong. Maybe you can't deal well with cold. Maybe you can't deal well with heat. Different parts of the clinical environment put different stresses on medical interpreters. Um, be absolutely sure that you always wear stable, comfortable, flat shoes so that you can stand for prolonged periods of time without um, being stressed or unsafe. Next. These are just some pictures to remind us all of the many different environments that we, that we are in. If you ever see um, a chemical spill, it will usually be a little bottle of formalin on the counter that somebody has just taken a little biopsy and put a piece of tissue into the formalin jar. They tend to get knocked over, and they're highly, highly dangerous to people. So if you ever see a chemical spill, anything that's spilled, get out of the room, take your patient out of the room, close the door, let somebody know to go in and deal with the spill. Don't clean it up yourself because it might be something that gets absorbed through your skin that's extremely dangerous. Next. Now, because we work with people, you are at risk all the time of a patient, a family member, occasionally a coworker, but really not very often. In my experience in 35 years, I have seen a lot of patients um, become violent or become threatening, some because that's their personality, others because of the medication they're on or because they're very afraid. What you need to do as the interpreter is be aware. Be alert. If something doesn't seem right to you, if somebody is using certain kinds of statements that show that he's kind of on the edge, let the staff know. You may be the only one who's heard him say those things. And if it's in his own language, nobody else is going to know unless you pass that on. So that is your responsibility as part of the healthcare team is to be alert, aware, and communicate that. Next. We go on to locked psych units often. You need to make sure that you leave everything you bring in with you before you go into a specific patient room and get a briefing from the staff before you go into the patient room. Is there anything I should be concerned about? What exactly are we trying to achieve in this encounter? Is there anything you need me to know? Always ask for that briefing. Next. We, of course, take care of prisoners. Um, Unfortunately, the United States has a very high percentage of its population incarcerated, and we will definitely have prisoner patients. There are some things that you really need to know as the interpreter in order to be safe. The first thing is that very often the person guarding the prisoner needs to go to the restroom or needs to get a cup of coffee because they've been there all day, and they see you as a very nice assistant to them and they ask you to just stay with the patient, who of course is probably manacled to a gurney or otherwise restrained. While they just head out for five minutes, they'll be right back. Don't worry, it's okay, fine, the person can't move. When you're asked to do that, do not agree to it. Say, I'm sorry, but when you leave, I need to leave too. Do not be left alone with a, with a prisoner patient at any point. Also, unlike with all of our other patients, we do not share all information with the prisoner patient. Particularly, we do not share information about when he is going to come back to the facility. 
because that could give him the um, a way to make a breakout. If he knows when he's coming back, then he can make a plan with people on the outside to um, spring him from jail in your facility. So you will not share any information about when he's coming back with the patient. Next. So just another reminder, all of these items you see here, your backpack, your umbrella, your overcoat, they will not go into a room with you on a locked psych ward and usually not into a room with a prisoner patient either because they can be um, grabbed and used as weapons by a prisoner who can, or a psych patient who can move very, very quickly. Next. You will at some times have patients who behave, or family members who behave very inappropriately. It could be a sexual advance. It could be the opposite. It could be somebody making comments to you that are extremely inappropriate about your background, about something about you. Um, you know what is correct, proper behavior, and you know what is abusive behavior to you. Be alert, be aware, remove yourself diplomatically and immediately from that patient. Do not be alone with that patient, ever. Step out into the hallway and let a staff member know immediately. Be very specific and write down exactly what happened because probably that will be needed later on to maybe make a behavior contract with that patient. Do not hide it. Do not think it's okay just because they're the patient. It is not okay. Next. If there is a disaster that happens um, while you are with a patient in a facility, it is up to you to decide how you are going to participate in taking care of patients, in making sure the environment is safe. Whatever you decide, let the people, the healthcare staff where you are working know what your decision is. Be as responsible as possible. Make sure that you don't leave your patient um, all alone, that is not acceptable, um, but be very um, proactive in communicating with the staff as to what exactly you are going to do and what, are you, what you are available to help with. Next. Because we as medical interpreters have a very, very stressful job, we are the voice of the patients, we are the voice of the healthcare providers, who have to give patients bad news a lot, we can't help but internalize a lot of what happens to us every day. And just like other members of the healthcare team, we need to find healthy ways to make sure that we decontaminate ourselves from heavy, hard things every day. We can't let it build up and say, well, I'm just not going to think about it. I'll go on vacation in December, and then it'll take care of itself. You really have to have daily routines, <clears throat> weekly routines of spending time with friends, doing positive activities, doing physical activity because that helps our brains, eating well, sleeping well, so that we can continue to take care of our patients and be, and be healthy and not get crabby and not get bitter and not get depressed. So I encourage you to find your own um, set of good mental health resources. And now uh, is the time for our um, next poll. So the question is going to be on your screen in a second and let Linda explain it to you first and then you can answer. Okay, so the question is, and you can probably tell um, how I'm constructing these questions by now. It says medical interpreters are not dangerous to patients as long as they just put on a gown and a hair cover, no matter what precautions are posted. So I'm asking you, is a gown and a hair cover enough to deal with any patient precaution situation? Yes or no? All right, and I see we are almost at 80% uh, uh, voting rate. So I'll give you just a couple more seconds, and we can then... Uh, share the results.
Okay, well, I'm um, going to uh, tell you that 98% think that this is a false statement. Right. So that is correct. It is a false statement. Um, putting on a gown and a hairnet is not sufficient no matter what is posted. So we went through all of those different placards and we saw that each placard described a different set of precautions and it gave us specific instructions on what personal protective equipment to use. Personal protective equipment is gloves, gowns, face mask, eye cover, um, respirator, and so on. So for some things you don't even need a gown and a hairnet, you need something completely different. So that was a red herring and I want you to always look at that placard before you go in the room. So we have my contact information here. You're very welcome to contact me at the University of Washington Medical Center where I work. You're also welcome to contact me as an independent health activist. I have some resources for you at the bottom of the screen there. I think you will really enjoy going to the Centers for Disease Control website. There is so much interesting information there about different kinds of infections and what we can do about them. And um, we can go to questions. I, there might be one more poll too, is there? Okay. Yes, I'll put that at the end, but I, well, since we have just about two minutes officially left, I want to read a couple of questions first about the content of the presentation and then we'll take care of the logistics. So um, uh, one question I picked out is uh, the following. Um, and I just, of course, disappeared from my screen. Here we go. I have been told by nurses and doctors that if we stay a couple of feet away, the droplets do not travel that far and uh, therefore not contagious. Is that true or false? So it's a question to you. Um, I would say that that is not sufficient. They, it, it is certainly true that there are more droplets right next to the patient than not, but think about the fact that that patient has probably been all over that room and so there is probably no surface in there that doesn't have droplets on it. And there is absolutely no reason for a doctor or nurse to tell the interpreter to do less than every other healthcare worker in that room um, unless there's a distinction just between people doing a procedure on the patient and everybody else. So sometimes doctors and nurses don't think of us as being even vulnerable to getting sicknesses and they want to just reassure us or maybe they don't want to take the time to help us put on protective equipment. We need to be doing it right. So if the medical assistant who comes into the room is wearing certain things, we should be wearing those things as well. All right, thank you. And also another question was the, uh, the when news uh, about the fact that the, this year's vaccinations for flu uh, were not effective. Have you heard anything definite about that? Yes. Um, there's a big discussion amongst all of the researchers and scientists who are working on this question, and it's not, it's not black and white like that. What it is is that we're beginning to have an even more sophisticated understanding of how the body actually works to produce antibodies. And for the first time ever this year, scientists started seeing that sometimes uh, when we have been vaccinated against the flu and it looks kind of like the flu that we were vaccinated against last year, the body says, okay, I already know how to do this one. I'm not going to learn a new trick. And so then we get the flu, which is just a slight bit different and it actually can make us sick. So what we think will be happening in the future, in future years, is probably we will have two flu vaccinations as opposed to one so that it covers um, different types of flu so that we'll have slight variations so that we don't fall into that gap between what the body thinks it already knows how to fight off 
and a germ that's just very slightly different, but enough different that it can still make us sick. So it's not, you, you should not think about this as the flu vaccination is not valuable or necessary. What you should think about is, wow, we are having to work so hard to make sure that we're actually filling all the gaps in how the flu, vet, in how the flu virus mutates from year to year. So it's good that we had that news because it means we're understanding it better. <laughs> yep, great. Um, another question, um, is it appropriate and ethical for the interpreter to disclose for the patient and the doctor that the runny nose uh, they're having is due to allergies? So yes, that, it, that, is, that is acceptable and correct. However, it had better be true. So what is extremely non-ethical is to have a cold and say that it's allergies. I mean, I would consider putting somebody into a dis disciplinary process very seriously if I ever heard that happening, just because the person said, well, I can't afford to lose a day of work, so I'm going to tell people that I have an allergy. That is not acceptable. If the person does have allergies, um, it should be documented at some point um, in their personnel file, if their staff, or in their agency file, just as a matter of record to back the pay to back that person up when he makes that claim. Okay, and then two more questions. One question: If you are a uh, contract interpreter, how can you get N95 mask fitted, or is there a procedure for that? Um, that's a really good question, and we've been trying to get the hospitals to um, allow fitting to to sponsor the fitting. The fitting takes about half an hour to do. I just went through it myself again. We need a staff. We have to do this every single year. It's required by WISHA OSHA. So it's not a trivial amount of time that we're asking. In the Seattle area, we probably have 1,500 medical interpreters, um, most of whom work for agencies as independent contractors. So if we're asking someone to take the burden on of doing that fit testing, that's a huge burden, and no one has accepted to do that yet. So I don't have an answer for you. In some communities, the hospital might very happily do that for the interpreters who go there all the time. So in some language communities, for example, in a, in a town where it's basically one or two languages as opposed to many different languages, the hospital might be willing to do that and fit the contract interpreters for um, mask respirators and 95s. It would be definitely worth asking them. Okay, thank you. And the last question. Uh, what are the protocols for evaluating recipients of the BCG vaccine? Uh, namely, um, and if an annual symptom questionnaire is enough, uh, or always have a uh, biennial chest X-rays, or only have a chest X-ray when the symptom questionnaire indicates it? Yes. Um, generally, we have gotten away from doing annual chest X-rays. I know in the old days, we definitely used to do that if somebody had a BCG. We don't do that anymore. Our hospital infection control people are very strict, but they do not recommend having a chest x-ray every year if there are no symptoms. What I do know has changed in the last couple of years is how we deal with um, folks who've had the BCG. And it's not just interpreters. We have many people on our staff, nurses and doctors, who had the BCG. And we treat them all the same as we do the interpreters on this one. That is that. It used to be if a person said, I've had the BCG, we didn't even do TB place, um, skin test placement on them. But we do now because about half of people who had the BCG are actually going to be completely unreactive to the TB skin test now. So they can, from that point on, have the TB skin test every year like the rest of people born in the States. So it becomes a useful tool for them. So if people have been practicing for a while and they're used to never having had a PPD placed, they might suggest to their own doctor, well, maybe we could try it and see if I'm still reactive to it because of my BCG. And if I'm not reactive to it, 
that means that the BCG is basically worn off. So from now on, I'll have the PPD every year. So you might go from being a BCG protocol person to being a PPD protocol person because of this, this aspect of the BCG wearing off for a large number of people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda, for your um, presentation today and for the answers to the questions. I want to thank everyone for the questions that you posted. If your question hasn't been answered, uh, feel free to email it to us. Um, and now uh, I would like to go over some logistics.